When have you experienced those moments when you clung to something you knew when something better was right there? For some in recovery, that's often your story. Clinging to something you knew and were familiar with, hoping to find joy and peace and comfort in it. For many of us, we've likely had seasons like this with with friendships or um, other things where we were clinging to that, even though it wasn't good for us. The influence on us was not good. Rather than stepping away and experiencing something better. And here's my question for us this morning. Is it possible that that might be what we've experienced when it comes to our life with God? That the life God wants for us is better than we're currently experiencing. And the holdup is not something with him, but something with us. Well, uh, hopefully you had a great week. Um, It was a big week in our house this past week. Um, Our youngest son, William, uh, lost his first tooth. And he's a little old for that. And as a result, I think uh, he's been thinking about this event and what it would feel like uh, for a while. And so when Tuesday showed up and he is uh, chomping on that apple slice... And all of a sudden, he gets that panic look in his eye. Um, We know what is about to happen. And um, he may or may not have yelled, I'm going to die from this. (laughs) I don't know where he gets that drama from. Um, But the reality is, he didn't know any better. He had no idea uh, what it would feel like for that tooth to be gone. And so... Rather than just pulling it, we sat there with it for the rest of the evening. Um, He complained about the way it felt, the way it looked, the way it made him brush his teeth, although I'm not really sure he brushed his teeth that night. The way um, it made him eat his food was different. He didn't like that. And he wanted no part of losing that tooth because he didn't know that it actually would be better once it was gone. And oftentimes in life, I think what's true for him is true for us. I can give him grief about it, but I know that I'm guilty of this too. Um, That I can avoid change, even if it's better for me, choosing instead to embrace what I know and have experienced before, something that I'm comfortable in or familiar with. Um, Ever had one of those experiences? Ever had a moment when you clung to something you knew because it was familiar when something better was right there? Do I have any fellow picky eaters in the audience today? Anyone? I know I am. And um, what I've found to be true later in life is that I missed out on a lot of good stuff all of those years. Um, one example, I think I've shared this before, uh, is guacamole. Uh, we moved to Texas, and I thought you all were crazy. Um, I avoid things that are green for the most part. And, um, and then once I had it, it was one of those moments where it was just like, I've been missing out. Like, we're going to be eating this forever and ever in heaven. Like, <laughs> this is so good. See, once I figured out that something was better, there was no going back. When have you experienced those moments? When you clung to something you knew when something better was right there. For others, it's something more pivotal in your life. For some in recovery, that's often your story. 
clinging to something you knew and were familiar with, hoping to find joy and peace and comfort in it, when in fact a better way of life was possible. For many of us, we've likely had seasons like this with with friendships or um, other things where we were clinging to that, even though it wasn't good for us. The influence on us was not good, rather than stepping away and experiencing something better. And here's my question for us this morning. Is it possible that that might be what we've experienced when it comes to our life with God? That the life God wants for us is better than we're currently experiencing. And the holdup is not something with him, but something with us. That a life filled with freedom and joy and love and peace is out there and ready for us to experience with him. The only holdup It's ourselves. See, in our series, Necessary Good, we've asked the question, what would it take for good to overcome evil in our world and in our lives? And we've looked at four things that Jesus did that it turns out are necessary for good to overcome evil. And we're talking about them in the form of questions. Why'd Jesus live? Why'd Jesus die? Why'd Jesus rise again? And why did Jesus leave? And what we've seen is that all that needs to be done for good to triumph over evil has taken place. It's been accomplished. We have to access it. And this morning, we're finishing up by looking at the last question. Why did Jesus have to leave? And what we're going to see is that Jesus leaving us, it's no awkward stage exit. It's not a stall tactic that he did. It's the necessary response so that we would experience his goodness personally in a deep way. But also his presence would be felt in a wide way to the world around us. And so as I was looking at this idea of Jesus leaving, in in scripture we talk about this as the ascension. It's the ascension. And um, one of the things that that stuck out to me is um, uh, similar to something um, with the Olympics. Anyone a fan of the Olympics when it comes on? Okay, about five of us, great. (laughs) When I talk to people about the things that they like about the Olympics, um, oftentimes what I'll hear, for for some people, what they enjoy are the opening ceremonies. Like they love seeing the different countries and the different cultures. They love the pride of the people as they're walking in. Uh, They like hearing the stories of the obstacles that these um, individuals will have faced uh, to get where they are. Uh, For others, it's uh, specific athletic events. And so like in our house, uh, my wife said years and years ago, um, okay, when the Olympics come on, you can have the remote all the other time, but when figure skating is on, I have the remote and we are watching it. And so we do. Um, And I said, that's fine. As long as when curling is on, we're watching that because I love curling. I mean, those are elite athletes um, competing at the highest level. And so um, we just kind of have that trade-off. And so uh, for for lots of people, those are the things they love about the Olympics. You know what they don't um, say in those conversations? No one says, you know, my favorite part of the Olympics are the closing ceremonies. I just love the closing ceremonies. That's not how people are. And I find that oftentimes when it comes to the ascension of Jesus, it's kind of similar to the closing ceremonies. What we do is we put a lot of emphasis on Jesus' life, his death, and his resurrection. And for good reason, those are incredibly big deals to our faith. But we don't talk a ton about the ascension of Jesus. I want you to think for a moment. How many sermons, if you're a churchgoer, if you regularly come to the church, how many sermons do you think you have heard about the life of Jesus? Well, or just let's, let's take the birth of Jesus. If you just come on Christmas alone, whatever your age is, you've heard that many messages about the birth of Jesus, right? Think about the death and the resurrection. Every Easter, we talk about those events, right? My guess is, for all of us, the number of messages that we have heard about the ascension of Jesus is far less than the number we have heard about the life, the death, and resurrection. And it begs the question, what are we missing if we overlook the ascension of Jesus? This idea of him leaving, what do we miss if we don't think about it, if we're not processing through it, if it's not on the 
front of our minds. See, the ascension isn't just the end credits to an incredible story, like the Marvel post credit scene. Like that's not what we're talking about here. It's not some awkward departure like the kid in the school play who says his line and then freezes before running off stage. Instead, Jesus' ascension is the next step in a providential string of moments and sacrifices that he has made as he worked and continues to work for good for us and for our world. See, if Christ had not left, his death may be a moral example, but it is no substitute for us. His resurrection would have displayed power, no doubt, but provide no confidence that God was pleased to accept us into his presence if Jesus hasn't first gone there to lead the way. See, without Jesus' ascension into heaven, our lives with Christ would be deficient to bring about good in our lives and in our world. And we're going to see two ways why that is uh, this morning. And so um, when we think about what is the ascension or where do we go in Scripture to see it, um, it's mentioned in several different places. We're going to look at one in Acts chapter 1. So if you have a Bible, turn with me to Acts chapter 1, and we're going to begin reading in uh, verse 6. Acts 1 uh, takes place. 40 days after Jesus' resurrection. Um, He's with his disciples and they're outside Jerusalem and they're thinking, okay, Jesus, he has conquered sin. He's conquered death. This is the time he's going to establish his kingdom and we're gonna be right there with him as this kingdom takes place, not just for Israel, but for all the world. This is what they were waiting for, what they were anticipating and they were thinking now is the time. And so they ask that in verse 6 of Acts chapter 1. Look at what they say. Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? Is this it? Jesus, this has got to be the time. And he said to them in verse 7, It's not for you to know the time or dates the Father has set by his own authority. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. You will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. And after he said this, he was taken up before their very eyes and a cloud hid him from their sight. So they're waiting for this kingdom. And he says, nope, that's not God's plan. That's your plan. And at that point, the ascension takes place. And he begins to rise and go and return to God's presence in heaven. Sally Lloyd-Jones in her excellent children's Bible picks up on a problem that we confront when we see the ascension. And she put it like this, Jesus's friends went back to Jerusalem with a strange gladness inside their hearts. And something Jesus said stuck in their minds, even though you won't be able to see me anymore, I'll never leave you, not ever. I will be with you. Yes, always, forever. But how can Jesus be with us and leave us at the same time, they wondered. It's a great question, right? How is it that Jesus can leave us and yet promise to be with us forever? He'll always be with us, we thought, and yet he leaves. It gets to the first way the ascension is actually for our good. See, for the disciples, as he leaves, this is not something if they would have recalled that should have surprised them. He had had conversations with them several times in which he told them what was about to take place. The ascension was one of those details he mentioned. And one of those places where he talks to them about this is in John 16. So uh, flip over to John chapter 16, and we're going to look at this. Uh, John is written by uh, one of Jesus' good friends, uh, one of his disciples uh, named John. And uh, this takes place, John chapter 16, uh, the night before Jesus is going to be crucified. In John chapter 13, Jesus gathers with his disciples. He washes their feet. In John chapter 18, Judas betrays Jesus and everything goes down after that. So this is right here in the middle of this. In John chapter 16, we're going to begin reading in verse 5 as Jesus is talking and trying to prepare his disciples for what's about to come. And he says in verse 5, But now I'm going to him who sent me, and none of you ask me, where are you going? Rather, you're filled with grief because I've said these things. But very truly, I tell you, it is for your good that I'm going away. Unless I go away, the advocate will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. And when he comes, he will prove the world to be wrong about sin and righteousness and judgment. About sin, because people do not believe in me. About righteousness, because I'm going to the Father where you can see me no longer. And about judgment, because the prince of this world now stands condemned. I have much more to say to you, more than you can now bear. But when he, the spirit of truth comes, 
He will guide you into all the truth. He will not speak on his own. He will speak only what he hears and he will tell you what is to come. He will glorify me because it is from me that he will receive what he will make known to you. All that belongs to the father is mine. That's why I said in the spirit, uh, the spirit will receive from me what he will make known to you. Now notice Jesus is talking to them and there's this emphasis on grief, right? He talks about that they have this grief. And for some of us, we may ask the question, why are they so sad? And we have to remember, this is their teacher, their friend. And what does he say to them at this meal? He's going away and they can't come. That essentially, what they've experienced for the last three years, it's over. Have you ever been dumped? Ever, ever been cut by a team? Ever been fired? Ever been told, ah, you don't make the cut. You're not good enough. In some ways, that has to be some of what they're experiencing in this moment. He's leaving and, and we don't get a say in it. We can't follow. How can this be the end? How can this be it? And to them and to their grief, what does he encourage them with? He says he promises to send an advocate. An advocate. This word means a helper or a comforter. The idea here is someone who comes alongside to aid. It was often used in military terms for a general who would come to his troops and strengthen them and get them uh, to press on in the fight. And Jesus is here talking about God's Holy Spirit coming to our aid. See, God's plan was that the Holy Spirit would come and reside and dwell within all those who have trusted in Christ. This would only take place after Jesus had risen and ascended back to God's presence. See, in this moment, that doesn't sound like a great trade-off to them, though. They want him to remain. They don't want what is next or what he would offer to them. And my suspicion is that everyone in this room um, or in the room with Jesus, they would have said, he's crazy. He can say that what's coming is better, but there's no way. He is absolutely nuts. It would be like if you told my seventh grade self that something better than Blockbuster is coming. Like, there is no possible way anything better than this could happen. And yet, we can give them grief for thinking that. But if you were to ask each of us in this room, hey, what would you prefer, to have Jesus sitting next to you? In the flesh, he's there. He can go to class with you, he can... He can watch as you interact with your neighbor. Would you rather have that or would you rather have what he promises, which is his spirit residing within you? What would you take? My guess is that some of us who know the church answer would say, oh, well, I, he says it's better, so I'll take the spirit. There are no bonus points for that though, right? I think what, if we're honest, what we admit is having Jesus next to us sounds pretty good. But Jesus says that's a bad trade. He says it's not better. He says, better that the Spirit comes. And he provides three ways here of what the Spirit is going to do and why this is better. Uh, beginning in verse 8, look at what he says there. That the Spirit, when, the, when this advocate comes, the Spirit, he's going to prove the world wrong about something. See, the Spirit's work here is geared towards those who don't yet know Christ. And the Spirit is going to prove them wrong about three things. First, about sin. Now notice, it, he doesn't say sins, plural. He says sin. Which begs the question, well, what sin? It's the sin of unbelief. For those who have not yet trusted in Jesus, the Spirit's going to work to prove them wrong, that they need a Savior, that Jesus is that Savior, and that they would trust in Him and Him alone. The Spirit's doing that. The Spirit's going to prove the world wrong about righteousness. That our righteousness falls short of God's. You know, for many of us, uh, prior to coming to faith in Jesus, when we would have been asked, hey, how, how are you going to get to heaven? Our answer would have been, well, I, I just have to do more good than bad. Or, or I've, I've just got to be better than most. It's all based on our righteousness, right? And what the Spirit is doing is the Spirit is coming to prove us wrong about that, to help us to understand that our righteousness is filthy rags, that it cannot stand God's judgment. 
that we need external righteousness as we stand before him. The Spirit's helping us to see that. The Spirit is also proving us wrong about judgment, that judgment has come on Satan, the prince of the world, because of the resurrection. That Jesus' death and resurrection satisfies all of God's demands, and as a result, judgment is coming upon his enemy. That's what the Spirit is doing. But the Spirit isn't just proving wrong. The Spirit is also enlightening. Look at verse 12. See, the Spirit will give insight and shed light on truth in Scripture for those of us who are followers of Jesus. This was true then for those first disciples. This is true now, so that when we engage with Scripture, we gain insight and wisdom because the Spirit leads us to that truth. That light bulb moment that you had when you saw something new or true that you had never seen before, even though it was the same verse that you had read a hundred times. How is that? The Spirit of God was working in your heart to help you to see that. Those moments where you're sitting around with other believers in community group or some other gathering, and all of a sudden you're looking at a scripture and one person sees this and another person sees this, and it's like, wow, how did you see that? I never saw that. What's happening in that moment? The Spirit of God is working in every single person in that circle to help them to understand more of what God has revealed to us that is contextualized in a way that speaks directly to the circumstances they're facing in that world in that moment. The Spirit of God is doing that. But the Spirit of God is proving wrong. The Spirit of God is enlightening. The Spirit of God is also glorifying. Look at verse 14. See, the Spirit of God and the Spirit's role is to point people to the work of Jesus, to see him and his death and his resurrection and to trust in him alone. That work of convicting, enlightening, and glorifying isn't limited to one space or time as Jesus would have been, but it's happening at all times around the world and through God's people. On Thursday, I had the opportunity to talk to one of our missionaries. She's in Japan and she's on furlough uh, right now. And she was just coming by our office to talk to some of us. And it was so fun to hear some of the stories of what the Lord is doing in her church and to think through um, the way in which the Spirit of God is at work on a Sunday morning there in Japan at the same time that the Spirit of God is at work here as well. And it's not limited by time or space in any way. It begs the question, what is the Spirit doing in your life that you're wholly dependent upon, though? Where are those things where um, you are living expectantly upon the Spirit to work in your life in a way that would convict and enlighten and glorify Christ? See, Jesus isn't inviting us into something we can do on our own, but something that we would have to rely upon him to accomplish through us. And sometimes that is part of the problem. When we think through this idea of living by faith and walking with Jesus, we don't take steps into those places where we're going to be wholly dependent upon him. See, we can love people who are like us on our own. People who like the things that we like, people um, who don't like the things that we don't like. Those are people that are really easy for us to love on our own. We can come and sit and give time to, to a church or to a small group. We can do that on our own, right? We, we can just show up and we can do those things on our own. We can serve regularly in the neighborhood on our own. But that's not what Jesus is inviting us to experience. Jesus invites us into more. See, Jesus left but didn't leave us on our own. Christ invites his followers to a life dependent on the spirit of God so that in moments where someone is antagonistic to you or to your family or friends, you're able to love because you are not alone. The spirit of God resides within you. We hear those stories of people who are following Jesus, who love their enemies. And we think, how is that possible? And if you talk to them, what they will say to you is, it's not me. It's the spirit of God working to change me. We hear stories of people who they're walking through the death of a family member or they're, they're helping to, to bear the burdens of someone who is in a marriage crisis. And we think, how is it that they're getting through every day? How are they putting one foot in front of another? And what they would say to you is that I am not alone. The spirit of God is giving me the strength that I need to face what it is that is before me today. See, you're not alone. You're not on your own. The spirit of God resides within you. How is it that people can, can plead with other people 
beg them, beseech them to come to see Jesus as who he says he is, which is Lord and Savior, with such patience and grace and love and compassion. How can they do that? Oftentimes what they would say to you is, it, it's not me. It's the Spirit of God working in and through me. See, Jesus has left, but he didn't leave us on our own. And what he wants is for us to experience good because his spirit is at work in and through us in a way that we would be able to see far more than what we believed possible or what we could have dreamed would have taken place because we are relying and living in a state of dependence on his spirit. See, the spirit is here to indwell us and work both in and through us in ways that are deeper in our lives, but also in ways that are wider to the far reaches of our world. Jesus says that's better. So it does beg the question, though. I remember having some of these conversations with my kids. Well, what is Jesus doing up there? Like, okay, so he's ascended into heaven. Like, what's keeping him busy all of the time? Like, what is he doing? And in Acts 1, we see him leave. He, he goes up, the clouds cover, he's ascended up into heaven, and Scripture tells us he has entered into the presence of God now and is still on mission for our good. In 1 John, we see one of the things that is keeping Jesus busy while he is in heaven. So if you um, have your Bible, turn over to 1 John, and we're going to be looking at 1 John chapter 2 um, in just one verse. Verse 1. 1 John is written by the same guy who wrote John's gospel, a friend of Jesus. He was a disciple and he writes to a group of believers. He wants them to understand what it looks like to grow closer in their relationship, in their fellowship with God. How do I, how do I know if I am doing that? So he wants to help them to understand that. In chapter 1, he talks about this idea of, okay, what happens when you sin? In 1 John 1, 9, he says that you confess your sins. But then in chapter 2, he continues kind of on this thought process. And look at what he says in verse 1. My dear children, I write this to you so that you will not sin. That's what he wants, that we would avoid sin. But if anybody does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous one. When we do sin, what does he say to remember to take stock in? We have an advocate. Jesus is our helper, our advocate, our comforter. I love this. It's the same, the same word that he used in John 16 to talk about God's spirit, that God's spirit is residing within us. He's our helper, our aid. Now he's talking about Jesus and he says, Jesus is at the right hand of God, the father. He's our advocate and our aid there as well. See, the image here is of a courtroom where God, the father sits as judge and Satan, our enemy, condemns us. Look at him. He's losing his temper again. Do you see how, how envious he is, how jealous he is? Look at his thought life. His thought life is a mess. How can you show him love and grace and mercy and patience? Again, he does not deserve that. He deserves wrath. He deserves to be cast away. That's the accusation. Again and again and again. And what John reminds us of is, where is Jesus? Jesus is our advocate. He, he sits at the right hand of the Father, the place of authority. And here's the incredible thing about this idea of an advocate. Elsewhere in Scripture, it tells us that he is our intercessor. The idea there is he's just kind of like a go-between. This word is different. An advocate is one who goes to one who's erring and helps bring them to another. See, so that's what Jesus is doing for us. Jesus comes to us in our sin when we are rebel, rebelling, prior to cleaning ourselves up. He goes to us to bring us to God the Father. He sits at the place of authority, reminding the Father, he's mine. She's mine. All the righteous demands I took in, in their place. Give them more grace. Scoop more grace into their life. Provide more mercy. Father, give them wisdom. Give them strength in this moment that they need. See, where is Jesus in these moments when we fail? He is at the very best place for us. See, his work was not once and then done. But he continues to do his good work on our behalf still. 
That's what Jesus is doing. See, John here reminds us to take heart and to remember that Jesus' work for us continues on. He doesn't do his work and then sit back and say, if they're really gracious for what I've done, they're going to live different. He doesn't sit back and say, this is all in their strength. They better get their act together this time. But when we sin, Jesus is our advocate, sitting at the right hand of the Father, providing for us. See, the hard truth of the follower of Jesus is we still are going to fail a lot. And Jesus isn't distant from us in those moments, but is instead in the absolute best possible place to offer us aid and presence as our advocate. His advocacy isn't dependent on our obedience, but it rises higher than our sins. His advocacy speaks with greater authority than our failures. See, Jesus' ascension and leaving didn't indicate that this was all in our own strength now, but that he would remain an ever-present help to us still. See, Jesus left, but he didn't leave us to ourselves. So where is Jesus in those moments of spiritual brokenness? When you lose your temper with your kids again, when you can't seem to conquer that sin and you feel like a failure, when you have that, that, that lust continue to creep into your thoughts or that jealousy or envy feel like it just kind of has you in a bind. See, in those moments, he isn't distant from us, but he is seated in a place of authority as your advocate to God the Father. As a result, there's no need for excuses or blame shifting. See, he is the righteous one and he has accomplished all that's needed to set us free, free of the need to defend ourselves, free of of that guilt or that shame that feels like it's weighing us down. And he is the one who is defending us still. See, Jesus has sent the spirit to guide us and he remains our defender before God the Father. Because this was the best possible way for good to triumph over evil in our lives and in our world. And is it possible this morning that you've missed out on that? Is it possible that you've been holding on to trying to do it yourself? Of refusing to walk in the spirit or yielding your life to the spirit's guidance? But thinking through your own strength or your own wisdom is the way that God really wants you to live. So you've been attempting, you've been failing. And that guilt and that shame continue to to weigh you down. And you've been struggling with that rather than resting in the promise that Jesus is your advocate. Even in those moments when you're rebelling. This morning, perhaps that's the step for you to take to look to his provision, to see the way that Jesus invites you into something that is better and to respond and to tell God that you want to experience that life with Christ, that Christ has secured that for you, one where you walk and step with his spirit, dependent upon the spirit's guidance and wisdom as the spirit convicts and provides insight and power One where sin does not rock your faith or your security. But in those moments, you know that the enemy has no grounds to condemn you because the righteous one stands and takes up your case again. So you can tell him that in the quietness of your heart. God, I've been trying to do this on my own. I understand that's not the life that you want for me. That the life that you have provided is a life in which I come with empty hands. And I look to you and your provision and your spirit to provide all that I need. See, whatever your biggest need is right now, whether you're asking for wisdom about a decision that has to be made, whether it's a relationship that's in conflict and you're thinking, I don't know how peace could ever come to this. If it's something else, you can look to do it yourself or you can take it to Christ and ask that he would provide that he as your advocate and your aid and your comforter would meet you where you are in your need and that his spirit would provide the guidance you need to direct you to take the steps he wants. See, when we look at a world that's broken, a world where evil 
pervades every corner in our world, it can be easy to get discouraged, to feel hopeless that good could ever come, that light could ever be cast, could ever cast out that darkness, whether that's in our own lives or in the world around us. But when we look to Jesus, when we fix our eyes on him, we remember his life and his death and his resurrection and his ascension. We remember that all that is needed, he's done. Here's the best news of all. See, his ascension anticipates a day when all of this is gone. When the same way he left in the clouds, he will come again. And in that moment, he will wipe away every tear. Everything that is broken will be mended. Every disease will be cast out and healed. Death will will be swallowed up in life. And that day should influence the way that we live this day. That we would be people who leave and go out into our world fixing our eyes on Jesus, strengthened by the hope that we have of a day to come when he'll return, knowing he has provided all that we need for good to triumph in evil. So that's what he invites us to experience, to be a preview for the world around us of a day when goodness and righteousness will reign so that a broken world will see him as they see the change in us. Let's pray. Father, we do come before you and we thank you that you are a God who is gracious, a God who is kind, a God who is true and right. Lord, we thank you for your word and the way that it speaks to our lives and our hearts and the needs that we have. And we pray this morning that you, your spirit would continue to work in our lives, giving us insight and wisdom into the way in which you call us to live. And Lord, that you would give us strength to do that. Lord, we cannot do that on our own. Lord, we thank you that you are a God who takes the name Emmanuel, the God who is with us. We thank you that your spirit resides within us. And we ask that your spirit would give us guidance and strength. Lord, we pray that as we leave this place, that we would be uh, fixing our eyes upon Jesus. Lord, that, that we would be able to live differently as a result of all that he has done for us. We pray these things in his name. Amen. Hey, thanks for watching. If something you heard resonated with you today, we would love to connect with you. Visit doxology.church slash connect or leave a comment below. And if you enjoyed today's message and you want to see more, make sure you give this video a like and subscribe to our channel so you don't miss any new videos.